Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. At the start of last month, February 2021, I uploaded a video on some of the history news headlines that caught my attention and piqued my interest from the previous month, the January. And I just want to say, the comments on that video were so positive and for that I am so very grateful. Thank you all so much. Additionally, I think I probably got this next request more than any other request on my channel so far. From the comments, it seemed clear that lots of you wanted this look at the news headlines to become a regular thing on this channel. But I'll be honest, I wasn't 100% sure that I'd be able to do what you wanted, i.e. make another video on the news headlines within a month. But I kept my eyes peeled and I made a note of the various articles that sparked my curiosity. And as you can probably see from the title of this video, suffice to say, the list was more than sufficient. So, here we go. Here is the history news from February 2021. As I did last time, I will be sure to leave links to relevant articles for each of the stories we're about to cover in the description box of this video. But right now, we've got a lot to cover. So let's jump right in. First up, Stonehenge has been in the news. According to reports, there is a plan to drop the nearby A303 into a two-mile tunnel. Construction of this tunnel is set to commence in 2023. Understandably, the proposal has raised concerns about potential damage that might be done to one of the most famous and significant ancient sites in the world. In order to mitigate any risk of loss as much as possible, archaeologists are currently exploring the site with test pits and trenches. There is another phase of excavation due to begin later this year, which is slated to last 18 months. But from the dig so far, we have these reported finds. We have a unique shale object that could have been part of a staff or club found in a 4,000 year old grave. There is a Bronze Age grave of an adult buried in a crouched position with a pot or beaker, a copper awl or pin or needle fragment, and an unusual small cylindrical object made of shale. It is suggested that it may have been the tip of a ceremonial wooden staff or mace. The fact that this Bronze Age burial includes a beaker or pot gives rise to its name, because burials like this are referred to as beaker burials or beaker graves. Indeed, there is another beaker grave as part of this dig. In this one are the remains of an infant, who has been found buried with a small, plain beaker or pot. Archaeologists have also found evidence of metal or leather working, which they believe was taking place on the site thousands of years ago. They have also found Neolithic grooved pottery, which they say may have been left by the builders of, or early visitors to, this impressive stone circle. Also found was waste material from the manufacture of flint tools. And lastly, but by no means least, they have found ditches that they believe may be Iron Age and which could be associated with the hill fort to the south of the site, known as Vespasian's camp. There is an understanding that it will be impossible to avoid any impact on the site. However, Andy Crockett, A303 project director for Wessex Archaeology, said that the trade-off was that the sight of cars and lorries trundling along the A303 close to these important stones would vanish, and that the two halves of this World Heritage Site, now split by the road, would be reunited. We're staying with Stonehenge for this next news piece, because another set of excavations, albeit at some distance, have uncovered finds that are thought to connect Stonehenge to the legend of Merlin. The investigation of Wine Mow in the Priscelli Hills in Wales was undertaken as part of the Stones of Stonehenge Research Project, led by Professor Mike Parker Pearson of University College London. And this project was featured in the filming for BBC Two's Stonehenge The Lost Circle Revealed. 
This show is available on iPlayer for the next 11 months, but I'm not sure how that works if you aren't in the UK. Nevertheless, I will leave the iPlayer link in the description box. The team believe that the stone circle, dated to around 3400 BCE, which once stood on the site, is likely to have been made up of some of the original building blocks for Stonehenge. The assertion being that the circle on this site was dismantled and the stones moved around 150 miles away to take up their current position. It's interesting for sure, but what's this Merlin business about? Well, it connects to a tale by the early historian and weaver of tall tales, Geoffrey of Monmouth. Writing over 900 years ago, Geoffrey made a record of a legend that told of the wizard Merlin, leading men to Ireland to capture a magical stone circle called the Giant's Dance. Professor Parker Pearson is quoted as saying that he believes the new discovery, quote, raises the possibility that a 900-year-old legend about Stonehenge being built from an earlier stone circle contains a grain of truth. That being said, he doesn't make a single mention about the wizarding factor of it all. Clearly an oversight. Next up, but before I start, I just want to be clear that I am reporting on someone else's claims based on their findings. So please, just don't come for me, Ricardians. Professor of History Tim Thornton from the University of Huddersfield asserts that he has found evidence to support the involvement of King Richard III in the murder of his nephews, the boys that have come to be known as the Princes in the Tower. Thornton points to the account of the fate of the princes found in Sir Thomas More's History of King Richard III, which Thornton describes as a coherent and detailed narrative of the murders, of personnel involved and orders given. He points out that More provided precise, circumstantial detail into how their lives were ended. Professor Thornton's study suggests that Moore may have received his information from the sons of one of the killers, Miles Forrest's sons to be specific. This alleged killer had two sons, Edward and Miles, who, Thornton points out, were not only still alive when Moore was preparing his account, they were also part of his social circle, as they were members, favoured members, of Henry VIII's court. Thornton states, Moore had direct access to the sons of a man who was in the tower with the princes in 1483, and who Moore says was the chief murderer. This evidence opens up the strong possibility that Edward and Miles Jr. were the channel for information about the murders. Far from being purely propaganda or a much later embroidery of earlier vague stories, Moore's account therefore potentially drew on very immediate access to members of the family of one of the alleged murderers. A portrait held within the fine art store of the City Art Gallery and Museum in Worcestershire has recently been able, due to an award of funding, to be submitted to long-planned and apparently very needed conservation work. Until these conservation works, the portrait had been covered in facing paper, which is designed to protect the image. The portrait was long thought to be of Mary Queen of Scots. However, once it began to be uncovered and conserved, it was discovered that the royal orb, scepter, crucifix and the lady's hat were added to this early 17th century portrait during the 19th century. It is thought that this image, made to look like it was of Mary Queen of Scots, was originally a portrait of an elite lady from the Netherlands, who, rather than holding an orb or scepter, once held a fan. Staying on the subject of things being altered, not what they seem, and or forged, we may have to rethink our image of Lady or Queen Jane Grey. Historian and author Leander de Lille explains, quote, a 16th century merchant gave us what was believed, until now, to be the only detailed contemporary description of Jane's appearance. 
in a letter, he wrote an eyewitness account of a smiling red-haired girl being processed to the tower as queen on July 10th, 1553. He was close enough to see that she was so small she had to wear stacked shoes or shoppings to give her height. The letter is an invention that obscures the significance of her reign. Dalil argues that this forgery served the Victorian desire to romanticise the tragedy of Jane. She points to Paul Delaroche's 1833 painting, which imagines the scene of Jane's execution. Delisle views this painting as having, quote, all the erotic overtones of a virgin sacrifice. Apparently, the earliest extant reference to this letter that offers this childlike image of Jane appears in a 1909 biography of her by Richard Patrick Boyle Davy. Delisle goes on to explain further, saying, quote, the letter, discovered by Davy in the archives of Genoa, seemingly brought this tragic heroine to life. But in retrospect, that should have sent alarm bells ringing. For the Jane the Victorians knew was already heavily fictionalised. By the 19th century, Jane's fictionalised life was enormously popular. But there was something missing from her story. A face. With no contemporary images or descriptions, the public had to be content with Jane as imagined by artists. Richard Davy seems to have spotted a need for an account of Jane's appearance that matches its power. He claimed to have found it in a letter in Genoa, composed by the merchant Sir Baptiste Spinola. The letter has been quoted in biographies ever since and used to argue the merits of lost portraits of Jane. However, despite an extensive search for this Spinola letter, Delisle has been unable to find it, or indeed any reference to it, that predates the 1909 biography. The cousin of His Royal Highness Prince Philip was Patricia Natchbull, Countess Mountbatten of Burma, and she passed away in 2017. On the 21st of March, 2021, beginning at 10am Greenwich Mean Time, there is due to be an auction of the family collection from her estate through Sotheby's. Among the collection are four pieces of jewellery that were made for Queen Victoria. They are items of mourning jewellery. As we are all aware, I'm sure, Victoria was basically goth AF, and these items are the evidence. Up for auction, there is an oval locket set with a section of banded agate, set to the centre with a cushion-shaped diamond within a star border, opening to reveal a miniature photograph of the Duchess of Kent and a lock of hair. The reverse with the inscription, Dear Mama, B. Org 17, 1786, from Albert, in remembrance of March 16, 1861. In German, you were our joy and happiness. It was commissioned by Prince Albert for Queen Victoria as a mourning jewel on the death of her mother, Princess Victoria of saxe coburg saulfield later Duchess of Kent. Estimated price for this object at auction is between £1,000 and £1,500. Next up, a pendant with a pearl upon a polished section of banded agate. The reverse with glazed compartment containing a lock of hair and the inscription 16th Nov and 14th Deck, 1878. From Grandmama VR. It was commissioned by Victoria herself in memory of her daughter, Princess Alice, and her granddaughter, Princess Marie of Hesse and by Rhine who both died of diphtheria in 1878. The estimated price at auction for this item is between £1,000 and £1,500. Next up is an onyx and seed pearl button, also memorialising Princess Alice. It has the initial A set with seed pearls upon an onyx cabochon, with portrait miniature of Princess Alice of the United Kingdom on the verso. The reverse inscribed, From Mama, V. 
R-I. So that's Victoria Regina Empress. 7th of April, 1879. The estimated price for this piece is once again between £1,000 and £1,500. The fourth piece is a final memorial to Princess Alice, who was just 35 when she died from diphtheria. This pendant is designed as a cross, the arms applied with black and white enamel, terminating in trefoil motifs, set with banded agate and cushion-shaped diamonds and centering on an onyx heart, with Alice beneath a coronet, set with rose-cut diamonds. The reverse with a glazed compartment containing a lock of hair and the inscription, Dear Alice, 14th December 1878. Maker's mark for Robert Phillips. Estimated price for this is slightly higher, between 2000 and £3,000. Obviously these pieces are incredibly meaningful and evocative and I wouldn't want to take anything away from that, but am I the only one who looks at this collection of items for sale, in particular the crucifix with the heart with Alice in diamonds, and thinks, does Alice Cooper know? Should somebody perhaps get the word out? Next up, we have the story of a broken millstone that was found along the route of the A14 in Cambridgeshire between 2017 and 2018. The millstone has just been put back together, I believe, and in doing so, they have revealed a highly significant and rare carved Roman phallus. This discovery, according to archaeologists, is one of the only four known examples of Romano-British millstones decorated in this particular way. Dr Ruth Shaffrey from Oxford Archaeology said, quote, As one of only four known examples of Romano-British millstones decorated in this way, the A14 millstone is a highly significant find. It offers insights into the importance of the mill to the local community and to the protective properties bestowed upon the millstone and its produce, the flower, by the depiction of a phallus on its upper surface. In the Roman world, the phallic image was found all over the place. It was associated with good luck. Indeed, I was first made aware of this headline on my Twitter feed because it was being shared by other history accounts. At the time it was being shared, it was also being pointed out that the rareness of these carvings is debatable. There might only be four here, but there are phalluses, or should that be phalluses? We'll go with phalluses. There are phalluses aplenty across the former Roman Empire. Steve Sherlock, Highways England's archaeology lead for the A14 project, explains that phallic images were, quote, seen as an important image of strength and virility in the Roman world, with it being common practice for legionnaires to wear a phallus amulet, which would give them good luck before battle. This millstone is important as it adds to the evidence for such images from Roman Britain. There were known associations between the images of the phallus and milling, such as those found above the bakeries of Pompeii, one inscribed with Hic Habitat Felicitas. You will find happiness here. The final headline I want to discuss for the month of February and this video is another Roman find, and from what I can tell, it's also a brand new one. This find was made at the archaeological park of Pompeii, and according to breaking news reports coming out of there, it seems that they have uncovered a nearly complete four-wheeled processional carriage, which they are saying they think may have been used as part of an aristocratic wedding ceremony. Massimo Osana, who is the outgoing director of Pompeii, says that the find is of, quote, very great importance in advancing our knowledge of the ancient world. We had never seen one like this in Italy before. It can only be compared with a series of carriages found 15 years ago in a tomb in Thrace, in northern Greece, on the border with Bulgaria. According to reports, the carriage is red and is ornamented with intricate bronze and tin medallion decorations, which are apparently of an erotic nature. 
Perhaps this is another story about some more Roman fallacies then. As I mentioned previously, news of this find only broke a few days ago. I have no doubt that as the find is more fully investigated, we will be receiving more information and detail about it. Rest assured, I will certainly be keeping my eyes peeled and my ears to the ground for any and all updates. And that goes not just for this particular headline, but for all of the stories that I've covered in both today's and also in last month's video. But what do you think of these news stories? Were there any other history headlines that caught your eye in February that I haven't talked about here? And if so, which ones were they? Also, if you want me to keep looking out for more history headlines to put into future videos, then do let me know about that as well. But as always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. Or you can come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box. You can follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then why not share it with your friends? But also, why not let me know by hitting the thumbs up? Please also subscribe to this channel. And while you're there, why not hit the notification bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.